We made our way to another small town in South Australia called Corn, Q-U-O-R-N. Another place that was a big rail destination point in the years gone past and there's a lot of effort going in today to make sure that that history, that heritage is maintained. We came for the Silo Light Show, amongst other things of course, but the Silo Light Show was what drew us to the town. So I'm going to put in some shorts from the Silo Light Show that will tell the story far better than I can or that I would, or that I do. Corn Light Show. Corn, of course, small town in South Australia. Have a look at it on a map, I'll tell you exactly where it is. Hard to miss, whichever way you're going. Just imagine, you don't really need a big TV, just some dirty old concrete silos and a bit of a projector. We thought we had beaten the crowds, so South Australia school holidays were over. We thought it had been long enough for the Birdsville bash crowd, red, big red bash crowd to disperse and just a smidgen early for the Monday Monday bash crowd to be assembling anywhere. However, we didn't think of, or we didn't look far enough into it, the 50th anniversary of getting the railway restored and, and getting some government support was coming up on just on the weekend just after we left. So if it had been any later, we'd have had trouble getting into the park. For almost half a century, the famous Pitchy and Ritchie Heritage Railway has been entertaining families in the Flinders Ranges. Soon the society, which renewed the famous outback journey, will celebrate a unique milestone. The Pitchy Ritchies provided a day out for thousands of families across Australia for generations. But the story of this famous Heritage Railway goes back a long way. On July 22, 1973, almost 50 years ago, a group of railway enthusiasts met here in Port Augusta to establish the Pitchy Ritchie Railway Preservation Society. The initial brief was to preserve dry stone walls and heritage bridges, but over time, from little things, big things grow. These old protest signs are sacred to the early volunteers who faced down a government prepared to let this famous railway line fall into disrepair. And as you can see, they won, with the Afghan Express mesmerising all who jump on board. But to run a steam-breathing beast like this, you need an army of volunteers, like Jack Hart and his dad Hayden. So I'm a third generation um, volunteer, uh, my grandfather, my father who's driving today. The society will need all the hearts it can get as it plans for the next half century. Its early brief was to save the track, then a year later came the rolling stop, like the engine Hayden's driving today. Still hauling railway enthusiasts from as far away as New South Wales. We're in the carriage that brought the US General Douglas MacArthur to Australia, a great platform from which to make his rallying I Shall Return speech during the darkest days of World War II. It was refurbished in the corn sheds by blokes like Wayne Hoskin, who's been working on yet another faded gem. Leaving your mark is part of the tradition, one the diggers took to with gusto on the GAN as they made their way to the war in the Pacific. It's a story Wayne knows from his work on the famous Car 5, with its secret panel of inscriptions. And that was another uh, classic find. We didn't know it was there till we stripped the carriage out. Preserving our railway past, it's now a 50-year tradition, and it's meant we've kept wonders like this beauty, the motor inspection car, and this little gem, the coffee pot, one of the true jewels in the Pitchy Ritchie crown. The coffee pot with a steam motor coach and it uh, ended up at Corn as a result of the Hawker people lobbying the uh, state parliament for a, a better railway service to Adelaide. It's enough to captivate any kid, as volunteer Ben Grapey was when he signed up as a 13-year-old. I'm a Thomas the Tank and fan gone wrong. I started with the really big train sets and now I have a great big train set to play with. So to all the other Preservation Society members who will celebrate their 50th anniversary in Corn on July 22nd and 23rd. Ron Candelar's 7 News. So the Corn Solo Light Show takes place at about sunset and it has a varied starting time as sunset has a varied time. So the first night we went down, and I probably should have shot this in portrait but decided not to. wasn't much of a sunset on this particular first night. We ended up shooting it twice. There was too much wind noise on the first one, so I shot it twice and matched the audio up and did some fancy stuff like that. 
well not that fancy for the experts but fancy for someone old and dumb like me and we got a reasonable production and the full video is I don't know, somewhere down below but i'll probably have to delete that because there's some copyright material there not copyright that's going to get me into trouble but copyright nonetheless so on our first full day as we do we set off in the car well, we got a bit of fuel in corn i suppose we set off in the car and we wanted to go to places like Bruce and Hawker. And on the way to Hawker for lunch, we stopped off at, well, we stopped on the side of the road and, and walked in the four or so Ks, two Ks, four Ks, can't remember, a bit of a rumble, to the Kanyaka Ruins, past Death Rock, the Kanyaka Waterhole. I think I'm saying Kanyaka correctly, but I wouldn't know. I got torn a new one for not saying Wirrabara correctly. I always thought it was Wirrabara, but when I look at the construction of the word I can see where where Rabara comes from so we walked into the Kanyaka ruins the Lodjo story talks about stations like this that just set up on areas that were too dry and this one became quite large and there was 70 families living and working there a cemetery wool shed but after several droughts they and at some states they'd switch that switched from cattle to sheep which would make sense out here you know pretty arid pretty marginal country for anything several droughts just basically wiped them out and it was abandoned it now sits on the south australia heritage register for us it was worth it worth it walk in and one we don't mind a walk and two we don't mind old stuff So from the Kenyaka ruins, we headed up to Hawker. We had lunch at a little bakehouse bakery there. It was okay. I believe I had a pie. I was also in the midst of one of those days. Had a bit of a headache. Didn't really feel like doing much with the camera, so possibly didn't. From Hawker, we headed across to Craddock, Carrington, and you'll just have to excuse me if that's incorrect pronunciation. And into a place called Bruce. We'd been on some gravel in through there. Quite, quite good, well-formed gravel. Those two towns, uh, Craddock and Carrington, a couple of fabulous old buildings in there, but plenty of evidence of breakdown of communal structure, really, I suppose, and jobs, people living in paddocks in caravans. At least that's how I read it, and maybe I'm wrong. And then into Bruce. Now, Bruce was a little bit eerie. I think maybe six people lived there. Essentially abandoned. It was a railway station stopover on the railway line between corn and peterborough we probably didn't do enough research on this we came to have a look at the railway station which was apparently something good to have a look at but it's long since become a private residence bit of a collection of stuff around this house here you know police signs post office signs that sort of thing but essentially just a dying town a lot of wheat planted and look, the day we went from another place called Cowl up to Cleve, uh, there was a gentleman come on the radio and, and it was interesting what he had to say, but that's for another time. But the wheat here seemed to be basically struggling. I'm, I'm going to guess that it may not have made it. Already marginal country, of course. So back and did the silos again. Reasonable sunset this particular night and I didn't think it was going to light. And I'd actually turn the gear around and back to the silos because it wasn't exactly directly behind the silos. Then after I'd waited for quite some time, it just whew, lit right up. So we got a few good stills of that and I guess you've got to bear in mind that's what I do is stills much more so than video. But essentially it looked like this and was was well worth the effort. So I've got the video, the solo art show again. This art show or this light show goes for 
for an hour and then another two hours after that. We, we didn't stick around for the two hours after that. And the two hours after that is basically showcasing local artists, photographers, you know, their, their reproduction of, of what they see. But the light show, for us, well worth it. Can't speak for anyone else. I, I know that a lot of people stayed five, ten minutes and left. I don't know. It obviously appeals to some and not to others. On our second day in Corn, we had a bit of a walk around, checked out some of the art and, of course, the buildings. There are a lot of buildings built a long time ago in all of these towns. But Corn's a little bit unique in that it, in, in, in its, its dedication to the, to the railway cause. And there's a little bit I'll try and play from the light show if there's no copyright in there. Rolling around Corn today, there are dozens of buildings that are well over a century old, preserving the unique character of this famous frontier town. Step back in time, 100 years, to the heyday of steam travel by simply strolling down the street. Imagine the horses, carts and laden bullet trains rumbling into town. Hear the crack of the whip and the sound of stock being loaded at the nearby rail yards mingled with the huff of steam. It's no wonder that the charming buildings, wide streets and spectacular surrounds have appeared in dozens of feature films and towns. Of course, a country town could never be complete without a pub, and naturally several hotels were speedily established. The grand two-storey transcontinental hotel built in 1878 is famous for the largest best ventilated billiard room in the north. It offered accommodation and refreshments and a place to hold meetings. Indeed, until the first St Matthew's Church at Corn was built in 1901, services were held in the Transcontinental Hotel. Across the road was the single story Pinkerton Hotel, which expanded to two stories in the 1920s and eventually became the Austral Inn. J. Edward Robertson noted, The present proprietress is Mrs. Tanner, who is one of the first pioneers of the Corn District, she having arrived in the district about the year 1874, when the present township of Corn was covered with scrub. She commands a big trade and sells much Jacobea from the fine brewery at Melrose further south. Her company is always interesting, and anything that is possible to do to make one comfortable and happy is done by the landlady. For over 140 years, these grand old pubs have continued to hold a most special place at the heart of Corn Life. By the 1870s, working men and women were acquiring increased leisure time. So to avoid them turning to improper pastimes, community leaders encouraged rational recreation being the pursuit of self-improvement by attending lectures at a local hall or institute. Corn townsfolk had every intention of having their own institute and town hall, but a series of bad seasons and disagreements about who would pay for it caused years of delays. The community persevered, raising funds and building firstly the institute in 1885 and then the town hall built from locally quarried stone in 1891. Their solid stone walls have seen hundreds of bands, halls, parties and presentations, feature films, markets, meetings, pantomimes and in more modern times, yoga and pilates. This used to be the bakery, closed 1957. Fast turning into the bakery tours of closed bakeries. That, that really does emphasise how hard people are working, have worked and continue to work to ensure that that heritage continues. That night we went down to a place in town and once again we'd seen earlier in the day that they serve corned beef mashed potato and vegetables. That's high dining for us and we thought well we'll go there and have that. And at the end of it all the meal turned out to be fine. 15 bucks or something but i couldn't help but think that the guy, guy he wasn't doing the cooking but i think the lady that was doing the cooking smoked the odd bunger not sure if she was smoking while she was cooking but the guy that served it i couldn't help but thinking that he looked like he was rebuilding a diesel engine between orders just had that type of look about him big grease and oil and, but anyway that's all part of the experience so In 
and corn, the bush food's capital, we will help you discover some of the most delectable, delicious, fascinating flavours and aromas of native Australian plants. For tens of thousands of years, plants of the Flinders Ranges region have been used for food, fibre, tools, medicine and ceremony by the traditional owners of this country, the Nukunu. And new knowledge has been added by Western scientists, avid cooks and gardeners, expanding our local awareness so that corn has become known as the bush food's capital. These native plants are super nutritious, healthy, tasty, and offer benefits for healthy life, culture, and the land. And whether you are a cook, a gardener, or love bushcraft, we invite you to visit Kwon's Pidiawi Bush Tucker Trail, nearby on Silo Road, to discover the extraordinary array of native flavours. Pidiawi is a combination of the Nukunu words piti, meaning bark fish, and kawi, meaning water. Along the creek trail that leads to the garden, you will see where Nukunu people have taken the bark dishes known as pipi from the trunks of the grand old red gums, leaving the trees to continue growing. This inspiring example of bushcraft and Aboriginal knowledge shows how working with nature provides food and tools sustainably. When you arrive at Pityawi, you will see many dozens of native bush food species that have been planted by the dedicated Flinders Rangers community. The Pityawi Bush Tucker Trail has been sectioned into three areas for you to explore. One is dedicated to plants used for food, another area is for medicinal use plants, and the last area is filled with plants used for fibre and tools. Prior to the arrival of livestock, much of the area in this region was covered in native perennial grasses. Species like native panic and kangaroo grass provided a significant yield of high protein seed that was collected, cleaned and ground into flour that could be baked on the coals. Our local wattle seed, or Acacia victoriae, is a highly nutritious food item, which is often used as a delicious coffee substitute. Wattle seed is very high in protein and contains several essential minerals. The many varieties of saltbush in the Flinders Ranges all offer different flavours and uses. The most beautiful tiny red, orange, pink and yellow gems on the ruby saltbush are edible. These bright little berries are simultaneously sweet and tart and can be eaten raw for high vitamin C and antioxidants. The fruit's wonderful colour can be infused into sweet tea, cordial and preserves, or use them fresh and whole in salads and with fruits. The leaves should only be eaten if cooked though, as they contain oxalates which are not good for you is a good reminder that not all berries or leaves can be eaten and that when in the bush you must be knowledgeable and precise about the specific plants to avoid being poisoned. Knowledge of the plants, their seasons and preparations can take a long time but there are some which are immediately recognisable and easy to use. Old man salt bush with its flat coin shaped grey leaves can grow up to three metres in height. Its salty and bitter flavour is perfect for infusing into meat and game dishes. And traditionally, the Nukunu use it to surround roasting meats and root vegetables in underground cooking ovens. Home chefs will be intrigued to try deep frying or roasting the leaves of this salt bush as it makes delicious crunchy chips. To truly appreciate many native fruits, you must allow your taste buds to adjust to accommodate bitterness, acidity, and high levels of sourness. The rich, tarty flavors combined with sweetness or other flavors provide taste sensations that people keep coming back for. The most famous flavor of our region is the Kwondo, or Gordi. While it is sometimes referred to as the desert peach, it is nothing like the European stone fruiting flavor, as it is very astringent. But when cooked and made moist and combined with sweet flavours or creams, you will discover a mouth-watering rich tart flavour 
famous for use in fruit dishes, jams and sweet sauces. Kwandong belongs to a family of plants that are related to sandalwood and the wild plum. The small tree is a non-obligate root parasite, meaning that the tree uses the roots of other trees or plants to gain its nourishment. This makes growing Kwandong fruit difficult to cultivate commercially. The rarity and difficulty of growing this fruit mean that local bakers look after their fruiting plants very carefully. The bright red fruits are most abundant around September and contain a large woody seed encasing a beautiful spherical edible kernel. The seeds may be ground for use in skin creams or used whole for beads and adornments. Tangy and sour, the kongdong is a perfect ingredient for meat or desserts, or as a botanical in gin, or as a jam. As it's such a distinctive and significant local bush food, you'll find it in many shops and venues in our region. Other valuable and useful plants that have provided medicines, treatments, tools and ceremony since the earliest recorded history are found in the garden. Discover plants with leaves rich in cineol oils, like eucalyptus and tea tree oil. These have long been used to help alleviate symptoms of a cold or difficulty breathing. Leaves from native lilies like Dianella can be stripped, soaked and dried to create material for weaving baskets and bags, whereas larger bushes and trees have been used to make shelters, implements, spears and tools. While you are in the region, you'll discover many unique flavours used in our local foods and fine ingredients that you may want to try yourself. Come to visit the garden to discover more about these flavours and open your senses to all you will experience in our region. Kwandong jam is a big thing down around through this area. We got ourselves a couple of bottles of jam. It's not to my taste, but I've got no doubt it'll be to some. It seems very sweet, so maybe there was so maybe there's been a lot of sugar added to take away that acidic nature of it. So from corn, we headed off via Saltia. Again, apologies if it's wrong. Sterling North, Port Augusta, and on to Kimber, which was our next destination.